Sometimes I'm very politely asked, John, what's your favourite game of all time? And I look at them in the eye. They look back at me. And I start sweating. I go, uh, Bloodborne, Resident Evil 4, Shadow of the Colossus, Puyo Puyo, Pound Upon, Breath of the Wild. I don't know! Because truth is, I don't know. I have so many games I love and admire that ranking one above the other feels impossible to me. So, I'm gonna make this even harder for myself and discuss another game that I'd call one of my favourites, Final Fantasy VII. Is it my definitive favourite? I don't know. Stop asking me! Final Fantasy VII changed everything. Deviating from medieval and typical fancy tropes brought so many more people into the genre, but more than that, it's just a flippin' incredible game. With Europe missing out on most classic RPGs of the era, this ended up being my very first RPG outside of Pokemon, and what a game to begin with! I'm not sure many games since have come remotely close. It's a game that keeps on moving, keeps going new places, keeps changing its focus while somehow remaining focused. Midgar's just the beginning of Final Fantasy VII, and the more it goes on, the more I love it. Midgar's great the first time, but it's so focused on story that you can't go off the rails. But as soon as you're unleashed into the overworld, FF7 takes on a life of its own. Every party member gets the spotlight at some point, and you grow to love all of them. Even this guy has his moments! There are too many iconic moments to count, whether it's the Tifa slap fight, Black Materia, or just all of Cosmo Canyon. It's hard not to want more of this world. And Square were fully aware. In 2003, Final Fantasy VII was no longer just the seventh Final Fantasy game. It became its own series, with compilation of Final Fantasy VII kicking off with a sequel, Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, a feature-length movie that Teenage John would swear to you was good. We also got Before Crisis, a prequel starring the Turks, though this was only released in Japan and on phones, so we're not talking about this one today, or maybe ever. But in 2006, we got our very first console follow-up to Final Fantasy VII with Dirge of Cerberus, a sequel that takes place after Advent Children and follows the obvious step forward of making a Vincent Valentine third-person shooter. Duh! However, the ending to this game had fans shook. Spoilers for Dirge of Cerberus. Yeah, I said it. <gasps> it's... it's, uh... it's... it's, you know, it's, it's him! Th the guy! This is Genesis, a character we'll become familiar with soon, but as of this reveal, Genesis was not a thing. They're teasing that Genesis is still alive before we knew he was ever alive. I don't know how they wanted us to react to this. So the following year would find out who the heck this guy is in Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII and... Uh, wait a minute. Advent Children? Before Crisis? Crisis Core? Dirge of Cerberus? Ever Crisis? Flipping Crisis? They think they're clever, don't they? So far, the Final Fantasy VII spin-offs were fine. Nothing was making the impact of the original, but it allowed us to spend more time with characters that we love, and seeing them jump off the PS1 into full 3D, or even CG, I was into it. And not only would they give us a brand new RPG, not a Vincent shooter, or a movie, or an anime, or a Japan-only mobile game, but they'd do it on a portable system only one generation after the PlayStation 1. PSP had been out for two years, and there were some games that pushed it. Liberty City Stories was madness for a tiny device. We had Wipeout Pure, Tekken, Daxter, simultaneous console ports like Tomb Raider Legend. It was already clearly a powerhouse, but perhaps it was still missing that must-have exclusive that could truly show what it was capable of. And in came Crisis Core. This was no phoned-in handheld production. Crisis Core is packed with fully voiced and really well-directed cutscenes. There's occasional CG cinematics on par with Advent Children, and it recrafted many familiar areas from the PlayStation 1 original and let us get closer than ever in full 3D. Crisis Core felt like a much bigger and more important game than Dirge of Cerberus, and that was on the big boy console! This is on the little guy! I guess most importantly, the point wasn't necessarily for us to spend more time with our beloved characters, but get to know one that was always shrouded in mystery. For those who haven't finished the original Final Fantasy VII, you might want to, like, pause this video and just, you know, quickly, quickly go do that. It's almost impossible to talk about Crisis Core without spoiling some pretty big elements. Yeah, this is a prequel, but it's not really intended to be played before the main game. If anything, that's going to really confuse you when it comes time to playing FF7. Zack Fair is a very important character in the PS1 game, but he doesn't really come into it into your pretty deep in. So I'm sorry, to fully talk about Crisis Core, we must first establish what FF7 has told us about Zack. 
and this has many spoilers for Cloud as a character. Big stuff, click away now if you don't want to know. You still here? Okay. Not long after you escape Midgar, Cloud and team settle in Calm, where he tells the team about Sephiroth. Sephiroth was once a good guy, soldier first class just like Cloud. Though, when he makes his way to the reactor in Cloud's hometown, he discovers Genova, and with mountains of research papers and documents in the Shimmer Mansion, Sephiroth's origins of being created as an experiment from cells of Genova become clear to him. He isn't quite human, he was created by Hojo of Shinra. Sephiroth snaps, but Cloud is able to fight back and seemingly kill him. At least that's Cloud's version of the story. Tifa was the person who guided Sephiroth and Cloud to the reactor, and she remembers a little bit differently, but to spare Cloud, she doesn't say anything. Parts of this story are true. Sephiroth did discover his origins, and Cloud did stop him, but a lot of it is warped. Much later in the game, Cloud gets poisoned by Marco and loses all control of his body. You take control of Tifa for a while, and Cloud is just out of action. However, when Weapon attacks, the whole town gets swallowed in livestream, and Tifa is able to enter Cloud's subconscious where his true memories are awoken. And again, if you've not played FF7, go! I don't need your views, all that matters to me is that you're pure. Anyway, Cloud isn't who he thinks he is. Cloud wasn't soldier first class. He wasn't even soldier. He was just a Shimra infantryman. But he became friends with an actual soldier first class, Zack Fair. Zack was there during the Nibelheim event, and a lot of the memories that Cloud thought he held for himself were actually Zack. The reason this happened was after defeating Sephiroth, the two passed out from their injuries. But in came Hojo, who took their bodies and used them for experiments. They were both exposed to Marco and injected with Genova cells. Hojo wanted to turn them into Sephiroth clones, which is part of the reason Cloud is so intertwined with Sephiroth. Four years go by and Zack manages to break free of his chamber and rescue Cloud in the process. But Cloud again, or again in the past, had Marco poisoning and could barely move. Zack replaces his drenched clothes with a spare soldier first class outfit, something that would also contribute to warping Cloud's memory. The two manage to hitch a ride where Zack encourages Cloud that they're gonna be okay, and having been betrayed by Shinra, they're gonna become mercenaries and leave Soldier behind. But as they approach Midgar, Shinra catch up with them, and Zack finds himself outnumbered and shot down. Cloud is in such a bad state that they just leave him to die. Though, as we know, he didn't die, and he makes his way to Midgar and finds Tifa. Hope you enjoyed the story dump. I tried to make it simple, there's, there's a lot of details. So basically, because of the poisoning, Cloud imprinted Zack onto himself. He believes he's an ex-soldier first class and came to Midgar to be a mercenary, and so kicks off the events of Final Fantasy VII. He believes he came alone to Nibelheim with Sephiroth, and to him, Zack doesn't exist. You even come to Zack's hometown in Final Fantasy VII and meet his parents, they ask if you knew him in Soldier, and Aerith and Tifa do, but Cloud is completely blank. Tifa knew him for being the guide, and with Aerith, Zack was her first love. She talks about him a little, but only really that he was in Soldier, and that Cloud reminds her of him. So why did I feel the need to go on for a while spoiling the story of one of the most important games of all time? Well, because Crisis Core leans on these elements a lot. It does tell its own story and throws new elements into the mix, but the adventure is always moving forwards to the inevitable, known climax. We all know Zack is going to die and become the foundation of Cloud, but let's take the journey and find out who Zack actually is. The train has been overrun by Wu Tai troops. Eliminate them and regain control of the train. Oh yeah! Get serious! Crisis Core begins with the incredibly familiar train opening sequence of the original game. So, what the heck's going on? Well, this is all a training simulation within Shinra. Why are Shinra troops attacking? Well, they're Wu Tai in disguise, of course. Square, do you think I'm a simpleton? This is a Shinra simulation. They could have programmed in Wu Tai, but no. They want us killing our own troops so that when the train stops, we can do a little flip and jump off the train and go down the platform. And oh, look, it's some Shinra troops just like the original game. The simulation is an excuse and a bad one. <sighs> but the game's pretty. For a portable game in 2007, this was really pushing boundaries. What was DS doing in 2007? Build a bear workshop, that's one! 
The PS1 had those little Lego Man models, but Crisis Core pulls off models you'd expect to see on PlayStation 2. It's so cool seeing these iconic areas mapped out in 3D this early on, and Crisis Core's full of nostalgic moments like this. But nostalgic, the combat is not. This was the era where Square went flip turn based battles, no one wants those, everything will be action forever. So we got this. You can attack as much as you want without being told to, and we have MP or AP meters. One's used for magic, and the other one's more powerful melee attacks. Or you can just smack people for free. There's even a dodge button, so if an enemy tries striking you with lightning, you can just go NOPE! Dodging lightning is very easy, just like in real life. Some attacks stagger multiple enemies in the same move, like the swirly thing which I use for the entire game. There are others that pack more of a punch, but when you hit an enemy, it cancels their animation and sometimes just cancels their move entirely, so just kind of constantly hitting everyone is more efficient. So if a combat system in an RPG isn't good, then a lot of the game falls flat. And I don't think this is great, but it's not exactly bad either. I suppose regular turn-based battles wouldn't be as exciting when the whole game revolves around Zack being mostly a one-man party. So this does the job. At least Materia works just like it does on PlayStation 1. It's basically magic you can equip and unequip. And actually goes a bit deeper. There's a chemistry system now where you can mix different Materia together to form brand new Materia. I actually like this quite a lot. There are quite a few combinations where it just doesn't really give you anything. But if you cheat and Google the results, you can get some pretty cool stuff. Ah, uh, but what's maybe the most innovative element is the roulette wheel. This thing's always spinning, and it randomly gives you buffs like MP costing nothing or being immune to status effects. But if two of the same character appear, it'll pause all the action and do a suspenseful spin. And if here you get three of the same character, which is pretty common, sometimes the game even gives you the wrong character and it's like, nope, nope, spin back, spin back. There it is. It gives Zack an emotional boost, where he performs a special attack that reminds him of the character. It's cool, perhaps, the first few times, but there's a lot of moments where I just wanted it to stop. You can't skip these animations, and sometimes an enemy's just one hit away from defeat, but the game's like, ha, roulette time! Oh look, you got a special move, let's play the cutscene. Game, just let me hit the enemy! He's so close to death! I don't need an airstrike on this little animal! You can't skip any cutscenes in this game, by the way. You watch the same thing over and over and over and over. Anyway, there's hits and misses. It feels really good if you land on Cisne, who makes every attack a critical hit, and then not long after that you land on Sephiroth, so you do a bonkers amount of damage all landing crits. But on the opposite side, leveling up is really, really weird. There's a hidden experience meter that the game never shows you and you can never see, so behind the scenes you're kind of leveling up traditionally, but you can't actually level up unless the roulette wheel lands on all sevens. So even if you've defeated enough enemies to level up, that doesn't mean you will level up. Heck, I leveled up three times in the exact same fight, as I assume I cleared the meter multiple times without claiming my levels? If people hadn't looked at the game's data to see that there is experience, I would assume that leveling up is random. Here's a page explaining it. I feel like I'm in school again. Combat isn't the strength of Crisis Core. I think it works fairly well for bosses, but in general fights, it's serviceable, sometimes intrusive, but it gets you where you need to go. Crisis Core's real strength is everything surrounding combat, but likewise it has really high highs and some pretty middling lows. This is Angeal. He is an angel. This is storytelling at its finest. While giving us more time to know Zack and dabble in some familiar areas, Crisis Core has a handful of original characters too. Zack starts off as Soldier Second Class, but his mentor, Angeal, the angel guy, is First Class, just like Sephiroth. This is Sephiroth before he finds out about Genova, and he's genuinely a good guy. Which is very funny because his character design is very much not, ah yes, the big hero man. So Angeal has suggested Zack for a first class promotion, and to prove his worth he must go to Wutai, capture Fort Tamblin, and defeat the Wutai troops. In hindsight, being ordered to invade and murder everyone in a fort should have been Zack's first sign that Shinra might not be entirely ethical. We even get a little look at a younger Yuffie who totally kicks Zack's butt. Look at her go, how will he recover? There's some pretty great character development in here, and Jill comes across as a genuinely likeable person and a great role model for Zack. And hey, he's got the Buster Sword! What's up with that? He also talks about a fruit called Dumb Apples for a while. These are a pretty big story component, but I just realized explaining them doesn't matter at all. So just know the script has the word Dumb Apples like 50 times. The level design is a little bit basic. It's one big stretch with a couple of hidden doors where Wutai troops lurk behind, so if you miss one you go back down the straight line until you find a hidden door and... Basic. 
To be honest, a lot of the game is designed like this. You could probably say the same about the original Final Fantasy VII, it is rather boxy and linear at times, but the dynamic angles and constantly changing scenery don't make it feel that way, whereas in Crisis Core, you're just kind of holding forward most of the time. Anyway, we take over the fort, we have destroyed part of a civilization, we are the heroes! Zack's doing great, but twist time! Soldier troops attack, but we're soldier! What's going on? Well, these are clones of Genesis. That, that guy. And with Genesis appearing, Angeal mysteriously vanishes, leading Shimmer to believe he defected to join Genesis in whatever attack they're planning. But why? Is there some kind of secret about those two characters? Yes, Zack gets promoted to Soldier First Class, but he misses the more toned version of his character design and can't truly enjoy his dream being fulfilled. This is the main setup. Genesis is the primary villain, Angeal is dipping his toe in the dark side but hasn't quite made the plunge, and Sephiroth and Zack have to stop them. But did you know Sephiroth, Genesis, and Angeal were besties? They even had an expensive CG fight in the simulation machine to show how much they truly love each other. In 2023, give your Valentine an expensive CG fight. I'm not being sarcastic, this is genuinely how they play, I guess. Crisis Core can feel like it borders on fanfiction at times, bringing in these new characters and acting like they've always been key parts of the story, especially in the points where we're treading on an already told narrative. But in other instances, I think it works pretty well. You probably don't feel like you know much about Genesis yet, so allow me to explain. Do you remember Loveless? It's a pretty iconic background element of Final Fantasy VII. It's not a big part of the game, but it's striking, I remember it. Well, here's the wiki paragraph for the original PS1 game. Here's the bit for Remake. Little bit for Advent Children. It's mostly just, hey, it's a poster so far, right? Well, here's Crisis Core. Genesis's character is basically that he likes Loveless a lot. Most of his dialogue is just reciting the story, and given that it's never been more than a poster, this means the writers could put anything they want as long as it sounded poetic for the moment. Nothing shall forestall my return. Do you fly away now? To a world that abhors you and I? Shut up! All that awaits you. Shut up! I'm warning is a you! Somber morrow. He's not a great villain, and mostly just serves to make Sephiroth a little bit more intricate, I guess. But like, are they still planning to bring Genesis back? The Dirge of Cerberus scene has been hanging for 15 years. Is Genesis going to be the final boss of Remake? Is that where we're heading? Do I have to hear more of this? Do you know the verse in Act 4 that leads into the final act? Of course not. So Genesis is also another Sephiroth in many ways. Sephiroth and Zack find documents for Genova Project G. These are performed by the scientist Hollander, who doesn't exist in FF7, but the experiment culminated with Hojo producing Sephiroth. But unlike Sephiroth, Genesis is not perfect. He's part of Hollander's shoddy creation, which is why maybe he recites poems a lot, I don't know. But he's very slowly degrading and dying. The three best CG fight buds just happen to become buds. All three being made from an alien is just a coincidence. Both Angeal and Genesis know of their origins, but Sephiroth only has suspicions. He isn't in Destroy the World territory yet. Genesis kinda sucks, but I guess it adds motivation to kill him so that he can't be in Final Fantasy VII. Stay away from it, Genesis! Angeal, though, has some really hard-hitting moments. Like, there's one where it looks like he murdered his mother, and Zack reacts appropriately. Punch him! So far, Zack's just kind of been optimistic and happy, and Angeal's just sort of been stoic this entire time, so it brings out a three-dimensional side to both of them. Not Genesis, though. Exploring Shimmer HQ and a small portion of the outside streets is pretty damn nostalgic. At first, it feels huge in scope, but it becomes clear relatively quickly that the scope is actually pretty small compared to PS1. However, there is more. Just like Cloud, Zack falls down the reactor and lands somewhere unforgettable. Hello? Hooray! Heaven? Not quite. Church in the <sighs> slums. Aerith talks about Zack in the original, but outside of the two falling in love, we don't know that much. The writers pretty much had a blank slate for what to do with these two, and both Aerith and Zack are quite similar characters, really. Despite Angel betraying him, Zack's still fighting to bring his friend back, and Aerith wants to help everyone around her. We see this a bit in the original, but there's a bit more depth here into Aerith's slum life. Like there's one part where Zack has his items stolen from a kid, and instead of going, Why I oughta come here, you! 
Aerith goes to find out why the kid would steal, not to punish them for doing it, but finding out why they would and helping them. The whole slum section's really cool. It's not exactly larger than the Shimmer building and outskirts, but it almost feels like it with how much it recreates. It is just the park and the slum market, but there's also the little street hub that connects the two. Everything's pretty much one-to-one -one with how you remember it. They even recreated the white void for this building, so it looks like you can go inside, but yet you can't. Crisis Core is a linear game, but you'll come back to the slums repeatedly. It's a really mellow break from some of the drama and action, just letting you spend some downtime with Aerith. This is a more grounded and human side of the game. You can do a little mini game to make some perfume for Aerith, and you can even buy her iconic pink bow, giving her character design a permanent reminder of Zack. The game actually opens up at this point into an abridged open hub. The Shimra building, outskirts, train station and slums all connect directly to each other. Even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I guess there's implied travel between the sections. The point of the game is mostly linear missions, so it's nice to have a place to call home, just to spend some time doing whatever you want. And if you don't want to do the main story, there is a whole list of side missions, and good lord, there are so many! This playthrough took me 12 hours, and it takes how many to 100%? I did all these back when the game first came out, but no, never again. They're all just little mazes where you go and find a specific enemy, and then defeat them, and that's it. There's 80 hours of this. I mean, you can get some special stuff from them, so it's not worthless, but it's a lot. Oh no, Genesis is attacking! Character motivations aren't explained that well, but now Angeal is back on our side because... Honor. I mean, last we saw you, you were standing over your mum's dead body, but I, I guess we can trust you again. So Genesis is here for Hojo, who sounds like a twisted Roy Campbell from Metal Gear. You think that if you obey Hollander, he'll stop your body from degrading, is that it? Oh, he is Roy Campbell from Metal Gear. Despite coming to confront Hojo, nothing actually happens and everyone leaves and you fight a summon instead. Anyway, ignoring all that stuff, let's get back to the important bit. Zack promised Aerith he'd build her a flower wagon so they can fill Midgar with flowers. So let's go and see Aerith and build that wagon. But then, oh no, Sung of the Turks is here and he's like, actually, she's not home and I would know because I spent a lot of time watching her. And Zack does not react to this one bit. So instead of being a bit weirded out that some guy's watching our girlfriend, we're gonna go to a snowy place because more Genesis clones. But more importantly than that, though, we meet another spiky haired boy. Me? Me? Gongaga. Gongaga. Good news, Song! Me and... Cloud. Me and Cloud here are both backwater experts. Oh yeah! Spiky haired boys gotta stick together. Cloud doesn't get a huge amount of characterization, but we get a look at a more vulnerable guy who just wants to join Soldier. And I suppose if you want more Cloud, he does have his own game. There's a little mini game to sneak into the facility, and I didn't quite get the point of this. You're meant to squat to keep warm, and then sneak around them. But I didn't really do the sneaking part, and got spotted multiple times, and by the end, I got spotted, but the enemy was just sort of running into a wall, so... Yeah, I just walked in. It may feel a bit too early, but it's time to stop Genesis and Angeal for good. We get a one-on-one -on -one fight with Genesis, and we go, Whack, 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 stop reciting Loveless! Whack, whack, whack! And he goes, Dreams of the morrow. So we kill him. But remember the golden rule of anime. If there's no body, they're probably still alive. And Genesis falling into a pit? Pfft, he's not dead. But then we find Angeo in a bathhouse. Alright. Now he wants to fight and throw out some exposition while doing so, and the scientist guy is here for some reason too, who also has exposition. Ah, you see, Genova Project G didn't stand for Genesis, but rather Jillian, which is his mother's name. And Angeal didn't kill her, she killed herself. He's really still a hero guy. Are you following this? You are perfection. <sighs> Zack, I am perfect. A perfect monster. This is very good writing. I don't really know why Angeal wants to fight us, I guess it's, it's something to do with honor. So the only logical step is for Angeal to absorb a bunch of monsters and turn into a big boy monster for us to whack for a few minutes until he eventually dies. And thus, in his dying breath, he hands Zack the Buster Sword. And Angeal is actually dead. We saw a body. He's dead. You know, I am making fun of this, but this bit's actually pretty good. There's a great scene with Aerith comforting Zack, and a lot of their relationship maybe gets skimmed over behind the scenes, but this is just a really good bonding moment. Some time goes by and Zack has changed his hair to look a bit more like Angeal and he's grown to lead in his place. And you know, we're getting towards the inevitable end. 
Zack's taken some time to relax, and he's chilling on what looks like Costa del Sol. And by chilling, I mean squatting. But oh no, Genesis clones! You know, this is how every act of the story starts, isn't it? Let's take them out with an umbrella, which does the exact same damage as our sword. You know, this seems pretty good, but at the same time, we just got the Buster Sword, and I kind of want to use it. And instead, umbrella time! Let me use the sword! We had a little peek at one FF7 area, but it's time to go to another iconic one. Junon, where more Genesis copies are attacking. And damn, it's pretty cool to be back in Junon, but I'm almost certain they've copy and pasted the exact same straight line and just kind of stitched loading zones together. All the clips I'm showing are completely different areas. They do change things up a little, like one straight line has you defeating a number of enemies so you do a bunch of fights in the straight line. Is that different? Not really, but it does culminate in a fight with the Guard Scorpion. I think the don't attack while the tail is up thing still applies, but I just kind of hit it a lot and dodged it when it attacked, and it died eventually. But now, it's time for something we've been waiting the whole game for. By the way, where are we going? To Nibelheim. But wait, we've got to build a flower wagon! We do this by wandering around the slums and finding loose parts to salvage, and usually I would find this a bit tedious, but because we know we're about to lead to our inevitable death, I actually kind of like this. It felt like one final low-key farewell, and the last time Zack will ever see Aerith. When we arrive in Nibelheim, Cloud is too ashamed to return home without achieving his promise of becoming soldier, and spends the whole time with a shimmer helmet on. We of course have Cowgirl Tifa, but she does not recognize Cloud because he's just a big helmet man. This whole segment is mostly so well done. It's very familiar, as it's obviously all in Final Fantasy VII, but we never got to see what really happened in depth. Only Cloud's twisted version, and later the revelation that Zack was also there. For the most part, it's kind of what Cloud told us, only with Zack doing everything that Cloud said. There are some good one-to-one -one moments with Cloud and Zack though, especially in the inn. Really shows how far Zack has come as a character, and how it's going to develop who Cloud becomes later on. You can explore the whole town, kinda, although the inn is the only place with a door. Sephiroth says you can go and visit your parents, but you can't, you physically can't let me in! LET ME IN! We've also got a little bit of the outskirts, but of course also the reactor, and the Shimra Mansion. The mansion in particular is so well recrafted, although this staircase got downgraded. What the flip is this? Come on, where are my spirals? And to be honest, the climb up to the reactor kinda blows too. It's now just a line of corridors, and they even cut the scene where the bridge collapses, but for some reason they included the bridge in the background, which has already collapsed. Look, if you're elaborating on a small part of the original game, you should probably include everything. Just a very weird part to cut. Also, this section sucks for encounters. Throughout most of the game, I thought encounters were predetermined. You don't stumble on them much, and most areas are too simple for them to seem random, but nah, they're for sure random. The game's not really designed to be explored, but here there's a couple of optional paths that lead to treasure chests. Let. Me. Move! But back to the good paths. The moment where Sephiroth reads through all the Genova research is so well captured. Even some angles are exactly the same as the original game. This is pretty much what I imagined a Final Fantasy VII remake to be like back on PlayStation 2 or PS3. And the scene where he goes mad and sets the village on fire is so good in 3D. Although, they've just ripped this CG Sephiroth scene from Avon Children. Don't think I wouldn't notice, Square! And the scene where Sephiroth rips off the mechanical Genova face to reveal the true being is redone in brand new CG, and it's so nostalgic. It's a really short clip, but they knew the power behind this. So, in the original retelling by Cloud, he storms in with the Buster Sword and stabs Sephiroth, but it's not quite as simple as that. Zack tries to stop him first in a multi-phase boss fight. There's one where you go whack whack whack, and there's another where you go whack 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 but on a very narrow platform. Zack ultimately fails and loses the Buster Sword for Cloud to pick up. And here's where Cloud wields it for the very first time, explaining how Cloud actually had the Buster Sword. Cloud! Finish Sephiroth! Off! Finish Sephiroth off. Sephiroth off. Sephiroth off. That must have been a really hard line to say. Don't test me! Use the power of anime. Use the power of anime! No. Impossible. With Sephiroth defeated and Cloud and Zack both weak from... Well, this, in comes Hojo, who kidnaps the two to use as test subjects. 
Zack sees Angeo in a dream, and trying to reach him, he breaks free of his containment, and then he just flippin' punches a scientist. Because Zack being soldier was already exposed to Marco, he's mostly fine, but Cloud's in a much worse state. From here in the original, this would lead to the ride to certain doom, but there's a little more here now. We've gotta get Cloud out of Nibelheim. And one neat thing is on the way out of the mansion, we can open a coffin, and look, there's a fella in there. Maybe this guy will have a spin-off someday. We get a much more elaborate chase from Shimmer troops. They attack Nibelheim and try and steal Cloud as Zack fights them off. There's a section where tracking machines try and get to you, but you shoot them with a flippin' sniper. The Turks are even after you. I think Shimra might be the bad guys. Zack and Cloud were both injected with Genova cells during their experiments in an attempt to create another Sephiroth, and so Genesis thinks this could be the cure to his degradation. So he stops Zack and Cloud and gets one of his clones to eat Zack's hair. I don't like this soon, so you kill the clone who ate your hair because it's really weird. I don't like that. And then Genesis just leaves. I hated that. What just happened? Zack returns to his home in Gongaga. We get a little tease about seeing his parents, but in the end, Cisne does it instead of Zack, as Shimmer would expect him to come home and see his parents. Kinda adds to the sadness that he can't see his parents before his death, especially when we know them from the main game. Gongaga isn't really fleshed out, and the main purpose is to make sure the side characters can't live to see Final Fantasy VII. So first, Hollander. I don't really care for this character, so whack whack whack, he's dead. Now it's time to head underground and stop Genesis. He absolutely cannot be allowed to live further than this game. The final dungeon is kinda tiny. It's also very similar to the last open space, where if you deviate from a straight line, you get... Uh... Anyway, we get through all of that, and Genesis has a few more poems for us. I suppose he should have a few last words. Hath endured torment. Oh, I can't take this. Whack, 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 whack. And your eternal no. slumber. No, whack, 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 whack. After a lot of whacks, he is finally defeated, and thus is the end of the original Crisis Core characters. No, no, no. Leave him. Anyway, time for a sad revelation. Zack finds a letter from Aerith, but this is not her first letter. It's her 89th. How could that be? We only just left. Well, no. Four years have passed since Zack and Cloud were captured, and this is Aerith's final letter. Boy, we've got to get to Midgar and tell her we're okay. But it's not that simple. The scale of the Shimmer Assault is so much larger than the original game, and I'm pretty sure the roulette wheel was made just for this moment. In combat, Zack uses the emotions he gets when thinking of these characters to fight, but here, it's Zack's farewell to them. As he's brutally attacked again and again, he thinks of his loved ones and those that he's tried to help. There's no way you can fight them all off, so all you can do is reminisce. We get a farewell to everyone. The Turks, Sephiroth, Angeal, Cloud. However, here comes a very familiar scene with only three troops coming to claim a hobbling, injured Zack. And the roulette wheel can only focus on one thing. Crisis Core is a flawed game, but the ending is incredibly strong. We knew where it was going, and it doesn't attempt to surprise us. A journey where you know the end can be impactful, and it's done so well here. All of its components just click. The story, the combat, the relationships. All pillars that are problematic elsewhere, but it suddenly makes sense in this moment. Over the years, I've held Crisis Core in a pretty high regard, and revisiting it hasn't necessarily put it in the greatest light. It's a huge production for PSP, but the level design is incredibly basic, and the core systems could be better. But yet, I'm still coming off it happy. Well, maybe happy's not the right word. I'm devastated, but I'm satisfied. There's for sure a lot of stuff that didn't need to happen, but everything from Nibelheim until the execution of Zack enhances Final Fantasy VII in my opinion. Well, you know, maybe not this, but the other bits. Zack's a really strong character, and after Crisis Core, I can't see Cloud and Aerith being together. The only possible way is Zack and Aerith. And how Cloud is so respectful and thankful to Zack and his legacy, only to forget him immediately, is pretty powerful too. I don't think if Crisis Core were released today that critics would be as kind as they were in 2007, but who knows, maybe the ending would still do a lot of heavy lifting. 
One thing I've thought about for some time is a lot of games just can't do what Final Fantasy VII did anymore. We can create big open fields and expertly craft a couple of towns, but so few games have a scope this condensed. It took some time for them to land on the direction for FF7, but active development seemed to take around two years. But in the modern era, it took over five years just to step foot outside of Midgar. Crisis Core is in many ways the same. It's on more powerful hardware, but it surely isn't trying to match the ambition of the original game. It's great seeing small snippets of Final Fantasy VII in 3D, but at the end of the day, they're just sets to remind us of something much larger. Crisis Core succeeded in showing that the PlayStation Portable could carry console quality performance, but I don't think it feels like a console game. It's surely more important than Dirge of Cerberus, and it's a story that fans actually want to hear, but very little of its ambition carries into the gameplay itself. Some would probably argue that it's great in spite of that, and in some areas, I totally agree. It can legitimately be an amazing game. A lot of the original elements of the story feel weaker than Nibelheim, and I'm not entirely convinced some characters needed to be in this at all. I think having more Sephiroths kind of undermines the actual Sephiroth, but I guess they wanted to give Zack his own antagonist. Crisis Core is one of the best games that I largely feel indifferent to. Even if a lot of it is meh, I still think it's worth your time. Although, make sure you play Final Fantasy VII first, because you really do need to. I don't think Crisis Core is a perfect game, but I still really appreciate what it gave us, for the most part. It dives into a shrouded part of Final Fantasy VII and lets us really experience and get to know Zack Fair. That's all it needed to do. So even though there's some blemishes and some characters I don't love, I still think Crisis Core is a great game and a brilliant showcase for the PSP. But please, and I'm going to say this very calmly, don't bring that slimy, wretched little f <laughs> This video was made possible by our wonderful supporters over on Patreon, and without your help, we couldn't talk about Crisis Core for 37 minutes. Patrons get a lot more than just a thank you though, there's a ton of perks including watching our trivia show What's That Track Live as it is, and a ton more, so please check out our Patreon. Thank you for watching, bye bye!